He stayed so far have enthusiastically declared themselves for one side or the other. But in some states, like Missouri, you have internal conflict. What happens when this turmoil is partnered with the main civil war? Blood. to Mr. John Wilkes Booth. He is turning 23 today. While Missouri has not yet picked a side in this war, that doesn't mean it's uninvolved. The majority of people in the state want to remain neutral, not wanting to serve either the Union or Confederacy. The Governor Jackson and the plantation owner class obviously support the Confederacy, but the immigrants, who are primarily German and Irish, support the Union. Those immigrants are primarily situated in St. Louis. In March, there was a vote on the issue of succession, but it was defeated 98-1. So, to many, it looked like Governor Jackson's hands were tied. Though he believed that the views on succession would soon change, and Missouri would happily join the Confederacy. His beliefs were supported when public outrage turned against the Union when Lincoln called for his volunteers. His reply was a stern and strong, Sir, your requisition is illegal, unconstitutional, and revolutionary. In its object, inhuman and diabolical. Not one man will Missouri furnish to carry on any such unholy crusade against your southern sisters. Now, Governor Jackson's main aim was to get weapons and arms to hand over to the Missouri Volunteers Militia, or MVM for short, who will not pro-succession had a Confederate sympathizer in control, Brigadier General Frost. Frost helped the Minutemen, a pro-succession group, be then integrated into the militia. Though, just like Jackson, Brigadier General Frost wanted more arms. The, the munitions that both he and Jackson wanted were stuck in the St. Louis Arsenal, who was under the command of Brigadier General Leon. Leon was a pro-Union man and a veteran of the Mexican-American War. He helped find the White Awakes, a St. Louis-based paramilitary that was very pro-Union, though right now Leon was just a captain, but he would take the charge of command of the St. Louis Arsenal and make it strong so it couldn't be stormed. Governor Jackson saw this and asked President Jefferson Davis for two 12-pound howitzers, two siege guns, muskets, and ammunition. I have been, from the beginning, in favor of prompt action on the part of the southern states. The majority of the people of Missouri up to the present time have differed with me. What their future actions may be, no man with certainty can predict or foretell. But my present impression is, judging from the indications hourly occurring, that Missouri will be ready for succession in less than 30 days. Public sentiment here is rapidly leading to this point. A few more days will determine all. President Davis saw Missouri as an important state and replied, Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge yours of the 17th instant borne by Captains Green and Duke, and most cordially welcomed the fraternal assurances it brings. A misplaced but general generous confidence has for years past prevented the southern states from making the preparation required by the present emergency, and our power to supply you with ordnance is for short of the will to serve you. After learning as well as I could from the gentlemen accredited to me what was most needful for the attack on the St. Louis Arsenal, I have directed that Captain Green and Duke should be furnished with two 12-pounder howitzers and two 32-pounder guns, the proper ammunition for each. These, from the commanding hills, will be effective both against the garrison and to breach the enclosing walls of the place. I occur with you as to great importance of capturing the arsenal and securing its supplies. Rendered doubly important by the means taken to obstruct your commerce and render you unarmed victims of a hostile invasion. We look anxiously and hopefully for the day when the star of Missouri shall be added to the constellation of the Confederate States of America. With best wishes, I am very respectfully yours, Jefferson Davis. This entire affair is controversial, with Leah not having gone through the proper channels, 
or claims by Confederates that there was a firefight at Camp Jackson. And what happens next is very hotly debated. Confederate sympathizers state that the Unionists fired unprompted. Pro-Unionists claim that during the mob, a drunk man walked forth, started shouting racist statements. Being the way of the marching regiments, he was asked to move. He took a pistol and fatally wounding Captain Blandowski. In response, the Unionist militia first fired over the heads of the crowd and then into it. 20 people were killed, including women and children. This started a riot, and it continued on May 11th, when the Union militia suffered more casualties as men left to visit their families and never arrived. Hatred was quickly drawn to the German immigrants, and the mob moved to attack them as well. Many German immigrants fled to Illinois in response. Governor Jackson takes advantage of this chaos, and using it, is able to pass the military bill, allowing him to create a military force and be the commander of it. Unionists call it a secessionist bill in all but name. The purpose of this bill, reportedly, is to stop any invasion, though in reality it's just a Union invasion. On the 13th, Baltimore is occupied by the Union. And that's where the week ends. All eyes are on Missouri, a state not officially in the war yet. Though, how long can a state remain neutral? In every state, there are supporters on both sides. Not to mention, both the Union and Confederacy need all the support they can get. In a civil war, there can't be a third party. A side must be picked. Peace cannot survive.